Welcome to the Wealth YOS show, the perfect place for women founders and CEOs to get inspired and empowered to make their dreams come true. My name is Nancy Flores. I'm a business coach, psychotherapist, author, and mother. As women entrepreneurs, we all want to feel confident and supported in getting the right mindset for success. If you're looking to grow your business and your team in a balanced and sustainable way, this is the perfect spot for you. Today on the Wealth by OS show, we have someone who I consider to be a yoga goddess. I respect her greatly and her way of seeing the world truly resonates with me. Her philosophy is to live wide, love big, look deep and always leave room for possibilities. Her name is Cole Chance. She is a YouTube superstar and she's been practicing and teaching yoga for a decade. She runs gorgeous international retreats. She's very much of a digital nomad and she's a wanderlust junkie. Cole's mission is to help her students build a positive relationship with themselves and their body on the yoga mat. It is so lovely to have her with us today. Cool chance, cool chance. Welcome to the show. Mm, thank you. Happy to be here. Good, good. I'd love to tell the story of how I met you. Mm. This was back in um, maybe 2017, 2018. And I started to become interested in yoga. So I took a few yoga classes and that was cool. And I thought, mm, I like this. So although I was a ballet dancer, I'm actually not bendy and I'm not flexible. So yoga was a bit of a stretch for me. Uh, but then I decided to start practicing at home. So I go on YouTube, I type yoga and here she comes. And she is this beautiful yoga goddess. Um, at the time called you had those long dreadlocks I just fell in love with you and you were doing those beautiful videos with your dog Shanti and your energy was so yummy and soft and your classes were really enjoyable because they were accessible even to me who was a complete beginner and the other reason why I, so, so, you know, we've become inseparable ever since. You didn't know it, but as soon as I found you, you're the only person that I take yoga classes with online. And what I love about your classes as well is the little nuggets of wisdom. Mm. Uh, you very subtly insert them here and there. And at the end, you'll say something like it's about yoga, but really it's about life. And I'm like, yes. Mm. <laughs> So my yoga journey has been uh, with you and I've learned so much, um, especially in terms of creating a relationship with myself, spending time with myself, mm -hmm. um, spending time on the mat, building a relationship with my body. I feel like it's been a journey of self-acceptance as well. I feel like I'm more accepting of my body as well. So for all of this, thank you. Mm. Mm, absolutely. My, my pleasure. Yeah. So wonderful. So wonderful to share. Um, and see how it, yeah, see how the things that impact me, like I'm just teaching, especially, I feel like sometimes I'm just talking to myself, you know, on the camera, I'm teaching to myself, I'm saying the things that I need to hear from me. And then for it to, um, yeah, to be helping other people to win, win. <laughs> you didn't know that was all you, did you? <laughs> It's really special having you on the show because I've always been curious about what goes on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I coach women founders and CEOs. I love everything to do with female entrepreneurship. And so I was really interested to find out more about the entrepreneur behind the yoga videos. And I have to mm -hmm. acknowledge your consistency because you post all the time, wherever you are in the world. And I forgot to say, that's another thing I love about your videos. With you, I've been to India, I've been to Bali, I've been to Ireland, I've been to Australia, I've been everywhere with you. So thank you for taking us. Yes. <laughs> and so um, I'm wondering, the world is pretty funky right now. So um, What's going on for you these days? What does life and business look like? Of course, I'm sure this pandemic has affected your travel plans. So can you tell me more about that? 
Yeah, it's been, well, like for everyone, it's been very, a very interesting um, adaptation that we're going through. I have had to cancel many retreats or reschedule them until next year. That's what we're doing um, for now. But I do a lot of retreats, but then I also do, like you, like you mentioned, um, weekly videos that I put out. So that I do do from anywhere at any time. So luckily, I was already doing the yoga videos where so many people had to very quickly um, figure out how to get the light set up and figure out how to get the things and like to move their business online. So I was really lucky in terms of that, that I already had, um, I had a little bit of that figured out. So that was quite an easy transition. And I happen, I love to film in beautiful places, um, to take my students there. And luckily I've been spending this pandemic in Australia and I'm walk away from several different beaches. So I've been continuing working and producing content, um, from here. So that's given me, I've stayed just as busy, if not more. So mm -hmm. that's that part of it. That side of it's been really, um, really fortunate. Yeah. Good, good. Where are you going to be traveling next? Well, it's, oh, oh man, it might, well, actually next week is my birthday and I'm going to Queensland um, up north in the Daintree Rainforest. It's supposed to be the oldest, not supposed to be, it is the oldest rainforest in the world. So I'll be there um, next week. So that's the next thing. But for yoga, um, it won't be until next spring. I have Taos, New Mexico coming up, Sicily, Italy, and Tenerife in the Canary Islands. So mm. that's um, for next year so far. Hopefully. Really exciting. Yeah. yeah. And until then, I'm learning um, this how to nest and root, which doesn't come natural to me, but it's been really delicious to, in so many ways, to have, um, to have a kitchen and to have a blender and to have some of these things that I don't get as um, a nomad. So it's been about five years. So I'm really enjoying, enjoying uh, kind of nesting for a little bit, but I'll also be ready to go because it's in my blood. <laughs> yes, and you were saying that this is your first winter experience in a long time. Yes, yes. And I mean, it's an Australian winter, so it's manageable, but still, I got like, little heaters on all the time and much overdressed than anyone else who lives here. Um, but yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you're coming to Europe next year because I'll come and meet you. You're coming up oh, to the yes. I can't wait to see you in person and give you the biggest <laughs> hug. Yes, that would be absolutely wonderful. Yes, I love you. planning on being there all summer. So, yeah. great, yummy. Mm -hmm. You are currently working on a yoga and recovery program. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the sound of that because I am a recovering drug addict myself. Um, I was hooked on cannabis for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I've lost those five years really because I can't remember much of it and I was miserable the whole time. But I got mm -hmm. out of it. And so recovery is, is definitely a topic that's very close to my heart. I'm really interested to know more about your perspective on yoga and recovery because a lot of my clients, whilst they are super smart, super intelligent, super healthy, sometimes go down the slippery road of unhealthy habits, whether it's mm -hmm. comfort eating, whether it's uh, smoking, whether it's overworking. That's another habit that a lot of entrepreneurs suffer from, workaholism. Yeah. They, uh, yeah, they're prone to that and they have to keep those addictions at bay. So mm -hmm. what's your take on how we can use yoga for recovery and also to prevent addiction? Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I think it's really, really good to, to realize how many forms that addiction takes that we, we think of it in, uh, as drug addiction and alcohol addiction, but really what an addiction is, it's a, it's a self-soothing technique gone haywire because we want to feel good and we want to feel, we want to feel good and we don't want to feel bad. So we have these little techniques that we use and often it's not meditation or it's not journaling or it's not processing and talking to someone. Often it's like, I can take care of myself and we find ways to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And often that means I'm just going to take this pill or I'm just going to, um, 
sleep with this person or whatever it is, or I'm just going to bury myself in work, things to not um, feel that underlying thing that doesn't feel good. And that's common across the board. And then the way, the flavor of that is different. Like what you use, what I use, what the scenario, like that all changes, but that thread is, that thread is there. Like the different ways that we self-soothe. And in my experience, it's really, and you, you touched on this earlier about creating, the more that we can create this relationship with ourselves, like beyond the, the conditioning and beyond the, the busyness that happens, then we, know, we, we start to know we're really good at lying to ourselves and pushing things away. But the more we have that relationship with ourselves, the harder it is to kind of like let those sneak by when we're not, um, you know, we're not taking care of ourselves. Like I'm actually feeling anger or I'm actually sad or I'm actually, you know, we start to realize what's actually going on rather than just layering that self-soothing on top of it. So it's kind of like um, just the more you know, the more that we know about ourselves, the harder it is to, to be, um, have the veil covering that. And for me, yoga is less about the postures. It's less about um, really even self-improvement. And I think it's so much more about getting to know ourselves and actually as we are, because um, often these things that we do is to be, are to be other than. Maybe the self-soothing is because we don't feel okay. So we do these other things. So the getting to know ourselves as we are, that to me is what my practice is about. I love that. I love what you said about yoga for you is not so much about the posture. And I felt that in your videos because you always encourage your students to not strive. Uh, this isn't about being the best in the class and achieving fantastic postures. It's more about being present and being kind to ourselves. And I'm intrigued because I also know that good habits can become addictive too. So there's a danger also for us high achievers to have yoga, self-improvement, meditation also become compulsive and addictive. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, certainly. And I'm in that industry, so I see it all the time. Um, and so it's, it's, people will be addicted to the self-transformation um, so a shadow side of that, sometimes even that word can be really challenging because transformation, transformation, when we hear that all the time, it's like there's something wrong with what is happening right now. Like I need to change. I need to be different. So for someone who suffers from not being okay, from not feeling good enough to always have heal yourself, heal yourself, transform, transform, it talks to that old story and that, that old belief. Uh, so it's really interesting. It's interesting what the beliefs are and then how we use semantics to um, how they can be like perpetuated. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. But again, that goes back to self-relationship and understand why we're doing what we're doing and um, trying to pick that apart. But it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. We're pretty fascinating monkeys when we're, uh, when we're curious about ourselves. So really, it sounds like with your yoga and recovery program, you're on a mission to help people feel that, that they're okay. So you help them go from, I'm not really okay, I need to improve, self-transform, to actually, I'm a, I'm a decent human, like I'm okay, I'm an okay dude or girl. Is that what the work is? That's a big, that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. Um, Cause we want to be, we want to be other than there's the, the that's where the critic comes in. Um, there's so many different ways that, you know, we're not okay with the present moment and it's normally something, something coming from right here. And, um, one of my teachers says, Tara Brock, she says often, you know, we have, we, sometimes we have these big goals of, I want this and I want this, you know, these big visions. And she's like, what if you just like, what if you just want to be okay? Like just to feel okay, how long has it felt? How long has it been since you just felt okay? And it's always like, oh my God, <laughs> it's been a while. And so I think that that's really, that's a really interesting reflection um, for most people. I found for most, for most students, it's like, wow, we're always trying to achieve and which is wonderful. I mean, that's, you know, we're, we're built to expand and cooperate and all of these things as well. But 
to check in with the whys. Again, it goes back to the whys. Yeah, it's really interesting. Cool chance, you're so wise. I'll be writing notes after this and I love this mantra. Like, what would it be like to just, what if your goal was just to be okay? I love that. Yeah. And so it begs the question, you are a women entrepreneur and you're online. So of course, as you're uh, building and growing your yoga business, serving your students, promoting your retreats, you're seeing a lot of other people do what they do. A lot of competitors, quote unquote competitors. You're, you're seeing what other people are doing. And so perhaps like all of us, well, I'm sure like all of us, there's temptations, right? There's the next bright shiny object, the next yoga course to take, the next business course. Ooh, and this person has a podcast, I want one too. And this person has this, I want to do that too. So tell me how you deal with that, with the, the striving, the temptation to be a high achiever in your business, to reach certain goals. What's your relationship with goals in your business? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good question. Actually, just last week, I was on the phone with a friend of mine who teaches some courses in something that, um, that I was interested in. And I was wanting to ask him and inquire about how I get some more training in this. And he kind of really sat me down and talked to me. And he was like, what do you, you know, all of this, like, what do you, what do you want a certificate for? Not that if this is because this was especially something that I'm in quite well versed in, not something that you know I really I really need some some teaching. He was like, "What is this about?" And I was like, "I'm feeling really insecure about this this part of my business right now, and um, I think that's what it's about." And he was like, "You know this," so it was a really interesting exchange. And he I wind up walking away and being like, "I do know this." And really having to remind, you know, remind myself. So me not feeling okay in that situation makes me reach outside and say, I need, I need something else to make me feel okay. And in that form, that's what that was, um, which is really interesting. But then that's, that's not across the board. I mean, sometimes we definitely have to reach out. So I'm not, I'm not saying that, but in, in this, in this form, so that was interesting that happened last week. And then in terms of some other, um, of other teachers and other things that are going on, um, like online and things like this, like, you know, yoga with Adrian mm -hmm. is, she is, oh, she's, yes. and we're both from Austin. So she's in Austin as well. So I remember going through a little bit of time. She started probably three years before me or something one of the first yogis and I remember being like, Oh man, if I just would have started like three years ago or two years ago and how big she's like, uh, sponsored by Adidas. And I mean, she's like, you know, she's big time. And, um, and it's just like, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing like really good work right now. And like, I'm, I'm, I really feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing regardless of what that looks like, um, compared to other people. But, I definitely fall into that, but overall my life feels really full and I focus, I focus on that, like the fullness of, of what I create and what I get to experience and yeah. But it's I love what you've just said about, yeah, it's <laughs> tempting. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty. And you're right. We all fall into this every now and then. Mm -hmm. And so what's your relationship like with your numbers, like number of followers, uh, dollar amount, What's your relationship with that? You know, my relationship with that is, this all was a really big surprise to me, the whole thing. So I've always, I've always just been surprised. So I'm glad I kind of came at it from that, from that angle of like, I didn't start out being like, I want to teach yoga online and be, you know, all these, it wasn't my goal to begin with. I remember the first class that I shot with Yoga TX, I didn't think anyone was going to watch it. I thought I was going to have a video for a resume that, you know, someday in the future I'll have a video resume. Wouldn't that be great? Um, I didn't think anyone was going to watch it. And then it just started blossoming and just started blossoming. So I really feel like my attitude has been really of gratitude in terms of this, um, which does get jaded after you've been doing it for a while. And then you want bigger numbers and you want, um, you want bigger things, but I don't feel, I really don't feel that attached to it. And I've always, I've always had enough. 
and when I get a little bit more, something happens that takes it away. And whenever I lose something, something happens that boosts it back up. And it's been really interesting to watch that, that it shifts and ebbs and flows. But I always, I always have enough. I always feel like I have enough finances. I have enough numbers. I have enough work. I have enough, um, really of everything. And it just continues to compile on itself. I do want to be a little more goal oriented in the future. Like I feel like I need to spend some more time there because I, I am reaching the, the things that I, that I set and, but I don't spend a lot of time there. And, and I think that I would like that. I think that I should. Mm -hmm. mm. Can I be bold and ask you a tricky question? Mm -hmm. Yes, look at that, look at that face. <laughs> um, I'd love to know, so you mentioned about uh, how, you know, you sort of, you're an accidental successful entrepreneur, is what I would call you. Like, you, you sort of stumbled into entrepreneurship, you, you smashed it, you're now a YouTube superstar. And so, as a youtube creator and a digital nomad where does money come from i know you do those virtual mm -hmm. retreats but how does one earn money doing that so the money comes from well you do make money from youtube so you make money from the ads it's not it's not very much until you until you're quite far along but it's residual so it continues so it's not based on month it just it's it's a there's a longevity there with that um, I also have a subscription service, Om Yoga Tribe. So there on YouTube, I put out short classes. And then I went with, um, and I followed yoga with Adrian on this. So she, it was the same model that she did, is that she went from um, doing short videos to longer videos, and those are paid on a subscription site. So gotcha. I, I did the same. And um, that is, that's a big bulk of it. And it's, I have a, it's a low cost. And one thing that somebody sent me, I wanted to price it higher. I'm always have a hard time figuring out the pricing and somebody sent me a really good, you probably read it and it called, it's called like a thousand true fans or something like this. It was I a, read it. a really beautiful article about like, don't try to hit everybody. Like you don't need everybody. Sometimes we think like, Oh, I just want to sell it super, super cheap to get as many as I can. And this was talking about a thousand true fans. Like if you have a thousand true fans that believe in what you're doing and are willing to pay, you know, this amount of money a year for your service and what you believe in, then that is enough. And kind of, it, it was really interesting. You should look it up. It's just like a, an essay or something. So that really helped me in the pricing. And uh, so that's been, that's been a really good move. That was a really good move for me to do. And then the retreats um, are just, are fabulous and they are lucrative as well. And I get to travel the world and I decide on the destinations based on where I want to explore and like mixing community and travel and yoga. Like I just hit the jackpot. So happy girl. Happy so with, girl. The, with, all wow. together, with all those together. Um, yeah, it works out, works out quite well. You created the digital nomad dream and congratulations because um, it doesn't come for free either. I, I know you've worked hard for this and you continue to show up consistently. Mm -hmm. What is it like to be a digital nomad? I'm really curious about what that life feels like, the, the upsides of it and the downsides too. Yeah. It's something that I've wanted to do since I was a little girl. I was born in Oklahoma in a, so middle America. In, um, and I grew up in a town of 200 people, like for the first few until I was six or seven or something. So like of all places, I just wanted, I wanted to go to New York City. I wanted to like, go to all of these places on my globe. From a little girl, I was just smitten with everywhere, um, everywhere, how big the world is. I remember my mom telling me, like I was wanting her to tell me where we were on the globe like where, where my town was, like to point to it. And she was like, it's not on there. And I was like, <laughs> it just blew my mind. I'm like, where are all these places? So I had that desire for a really, for a really long time. And it's not for everyone. It can be really challenging to move around and not have that rootedness. 
So to be able, you really need to be able to find that, that alignment and that uh, centering as you're traveling. I moved a lot as a child. So I feel like that came kind of natural to me. Um, and there is quite a bit of energy that you spend on just logistics, like just in the time that I spend on getting plane tickets, booking accommodation, uh, my visa paperwork, like that actually is like a, that's a chunk of, a chunk of time. Um, do you have a team that helps you with that? I, I have an assistant that helps me with some of the booking and stuff, but I really like, I really like doing that. Like I want to find my villa and I want to, you know, it's kind of exciting. So I, I, I put some of the things that are, I don't find as exciting on, um, on that workload, but I'm trying to think some of the, some of the downsides. What about friendships? Your relationships are challenging. Um, I was, I've been single until recently for the most part um, because it's, it's really challenging to do long distance. It's not impossible, but it's really challenging. Um, always feeling like you're leaving. And sometimes you move really quickly. And sometimes I stay for like two or three months at a time. And one thing that I notice when I'm not gonna be somewhere for very long, I can notice that I'm a little bit more like I'm a little bit more shut off and it's like you tell me your name and maybe I don't store it as deep as I should because I know that you know I'm leaving in a little bit and I don't notice it so much until I get somewhere where I know I'm going to stay for three months or something like this and then I realize I'm at a cafe and I meet somebody and I like absorb the name I absorb the face I absorb all these things and I'm like that feels so different so that's something that I check in with um, whenever I'm traveling for short and for and for longer periods is to try to have that more equanimous. Um, friendships, I maintain, I'm quite good at long distance relationships, especially with, especially with friends. Most of my friends are also um, digital nomads, so they're traveling all the time, um, which is beautiful because almost everywhere I go, I have someone that, I, that I'm so excited to see and catch up with and um, in a pl place to stay somewhere or we go on adventures all the time, but, to have that longevity with somebody who like knows you just in and out and on your bad days and you know, all of that, that's not there as much. Um, so that, that can be challenging and groups of friends as well. Sometimes I'm jealous when I see like, like a, a group of like 10 women out somewhere because when I'm traveling, I'm normally like going to visit a friend or you know one person or something like this unless i'm at a retreat but these like women who have known each other from since high school or something like this like i don't have groups of friends like that necessarily because we're always on the move but i see with it. and so super happy to hear that you found love mm -hmm. and i'd love to know is he a digital nomad too He's kind of in between right now. So when I met him, I was, we were both guest teachers on a training in Guatemala with a, a mutual friend of ours. So we met through that is how I met him. So he was, you know, traveling then, but he does have a full-time job here in Sydney right now, which works out perfect because I can't go anywhere <laughs> this year. And then as of next year, he has an exit strategy to, um, to be moving everything online as well. So he teaches and is a, uh, and is a therapist. So he can, he can begin to move that online. So. Wonderful. Exciting. Exciting plans for next year. Yes. What's the, what's the gear when you're a digital nomad? Is there like a special Wi-Fi stick that you travel with? What's the, what's on your toolkit as a digital nomad? I've heard about these Wi-Fi sticks and I need to check them out, but I feel like they're location based. That's something that's on my list to check out because I think you have to get it through a service is what I've heard, like a local service, but that's on the list. I do travel with all of my camera stuff, lots of cords, lots of cords. I look forward to the day when we look back and say, do you remember when we had all those cords? Wasn't that crazy? But that's not happening yet. Do you mean um, cables? Is that what you mean? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mine are so tangled. I don't have that figured out yet. You would think that I would be like so on it with all these cables or cords, but those are just forever messy. Um, 
and really it's just amazing. You just need your computer. Like if you're just going, if I'm just going for a short trip or something that I can work from anywhere with a computer or a tripod and I have the new iPhone 11. So that's what I actually am now shooting the videos on. Like that's amazing. Really, really amazing. I agree. The iPhone 11 changed my life as well. Thank you, Apple. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for everything you're sharing with us about the digital nomad lifestyle. A lot mm -hmm. of my women entrepreneurs are aspiring to that. And I'm curious, you said that you had friends who also wear digital nomads. Do you know anyone who does it with uh, like children? Because I have two kids myself. I'd love to know, like, would it be possible to do that? Yeah, yeah, people definitely do. Um, I have, yeah, I, they, the girls, my friends that I know that, that travel, they might have like, they don't move as, around as much. They might have three or four places and they might kind of go back and forth and kind of move and move in that way. And, you know, in certain places that you go, so for Bali, for instance, um, is that you can get really great childcare. So then there's a lot of support um, with um, some, of the, some of the locals. But that's a really, really common that you would be uh, getting support and stuff there, which the mamas love. <laughs> like if they are in Europe or something and they come back to Bali, they're like, oh, we're so happy to be back here and have the support, um, the mama support. True, true. I agree. One of my clients recently traveled to Bali with uh, four children and she hired a nanny who just came in. She sat with them. Uh, she stayed during the day. She cooked. She did everything. It was wonderful. And it ended up being even better than the life that they had in Europe. So, yeah, <laughs> Good. I agree. Yeah. Now, something I've noticed as a woman founder myself is that the line between work and life becomes blurry. Uh, I personally work in, a, in an office that is home-based mm -hmm. and so the only boundary between work and life right now is, is my office door mm -hmm. and so going back to the iPhone it's true with the iPhone we can Instagram anytime send emails anytime and so how do you strike the balance between work and life and also how do you create those boundaries that took a little bit of doing for me. And, and even though I haven't had a home, you know, a home office, I, I, I totally see how that would be really, really challenging. I get really excited about projects that I'm working on, especially when I'm working on new retreats. Um, one thing about being a digital nomad is that you're working in all time zones at all times, or I, I am anyway, is that I have students from all over. I might be working with a co-teacher in America, working with the retreat center that's in Europe, but I'm in Bali. So it's like, I always have um, emails coming in at any given time. The notifications, the emails, things like this are always coming. So really regulating um, the time that I'm working can be, can be challenging. And I, I switch my strategy. Um, I, s I always am switching my strategy up on how I, how I try to maneuver it and what I think is the best. What's your current system? What's, what's a day for you right now, a working day? Well, it's really nice now because I, I have my partner. So he goes to work and he comes back around four or five. So I cater my days to that, which normally, normally I wouldn't so much. So I wake up in the morning and I normally will move my body, um, whether I'm doing yoga here at home or whether I'm going to a class. Um, I really like to be told what to do sometimes because I, I'm teaching all the time. And then I'll go sit at, uh, go sit at a cafe and open up the computer and begin to see what is on the agenda that day. And, and that's then four o'clock, he comes home. Four o'clock, yep. And four o'clock, I'm um, wrapping it up and figuring out what to do for dinner, what I'm going to cook for dinner. That's something that is like not in my repertoire. <laughs> like I've never cooked so much in my life. Um, I love it. I absolutely love it. Yay. It's just not I used to doing. So I'm like, what should I cook for dinner? Like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm playing housewife and it's actually very fun. Yay. Yay. Cold Chance has a kitchen now. Yes. 
So talking about work-life balance, I hear that right now your days are pretty simple. You work during the day and then four o'clock comes and then you think about dinner. How do you keep your phone away when you're living your life? How do you keep the Instagram notifications at bay? Well, I turn the notifications off. So I actually don't have notifications on. The only thing I have notifications on actually is, is my WhatsApp. So I took all the notifications off. Well, WhatsApp and Messenger are the two that I have that I that I have notifications on. And the rest of it, I just, you know, I don't need, I don't need to see it right away. I I used to be really hyper responsive. So that was an issue for me to pull away from. Like I really wanted everyone to know that they're being heard to the point of I was on my phone all the time. Um, whether it be from Instagram or a comment on YouTube or something like this. Like it's just a lot. I had a lot of platforms that I was constantly having to check. And I just finally had to be like, that is not necessary. Like no one expects you to do this. Something I was really putting pressure on to myself. So um, pulling that back and I have a thing where I try to reply, try to reply within a week and I can almost always make that. Smart move. I love that. It's challenging. it's challenging. And I do notice, I do notice if I'm anxious or I'm not, and I'm, if I'm feeling anxious or if I'm like, if, if I'm unsettled somehow that I do tend to busy myself. Like I'll be in work mode a little bit more. So have to, yeah, have to kind of watch that. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And I, I probably do it too. I wonder how this works. So we feel an underlying anxiety and mm -hmm. we compensate by working more. How, how does that work? How does that work for you? Well, I think one thing that it does for me is that I think if I'm feeling anxiety, I don't feel like I'm in control. But when I'm working, I know what I'm doing. I feel I'm in control of that situation. Um, so that's what I think. That's my, that's my theory is that I go from feeling out of control to like, Oh, I can answer an email. I go from point A to point B productive, <laughs> or, you know, I'm getting some little dopamine hit too. Um, Pat on the when back. I'm, I'm worrying and then it also gives the distraction. So I think between the, both of those things, um, I think that's what's going on. And my mother, and I, I may have that insight because, you know, my mother was, was quite a workaholic and um, she, she told me, I mean, I was, a, I was an alcoholic, she was a workaholic, but she told me that she, it was so hard to be, to be my mother at certain times during, you know, during my addiction that, that she would bury herself in work because she knew what she was doing there. She goes, I didn't know how to be a mom, but I knew how, I knew how to do my job. And um, Yeah. So I see little bits of that, not, not to her, not, to, not to that experience, but I see little bits of that, how um, that really makes a lot of sense. Mm. Thank you for mentioning that. It's definitely something for me to pay attention to and for all of us mm -hmm. to, to pay attention to that, what happens when you feel anxious. And so on that note, I'd love to know which ones of the, so when we had a chat last week, you talked about, 10 yogi principles we talked about integrity showing up on meetings on time being true to your word i love that and so i'm wondering which one of the yogi principles are helpful for your business mm, oh man probably all of them um they're called the yamas and the niyamas if anyone wants to look them up they're, they're really amazing um i think that Satcha, that means truthfulness. So that would really be, you know, integrity, I think is, is very, it's very important that, you know, I'm showing up the way that I'm showing up. Like I, I'm telling you, or I'm showing, showing up the way that I am so that I'm not going to then have anxiety about trying to be something that I'm not later on. I also don't want to, I also don't, I also want for your sake to be the person who I am. Like it just takes, it just takes all the, the mess out of it. So I really think that that's a really big one, the, um, the integrity. And um, yeah, the Saucha is, clean, is, is a cleanliness. 
and some people interpret that as um, well, not cleanliness. Let me think of the the oh the non-stealing asteia, so non-stealing. So this, you know, these were written like two thousand years ago, but it goes from the point of not just things, not just energy, but how are you stealing people's time? Like how can you see how are you stealing your own time um, by you know scrolling all day or doing these things? It's like how are you stealing the present moment? How are you stealing? Um, being late for meetings, uh, being respectful of people's time. I think that that's really, a, that, that one's a really interesting one. And energy as well, I think is really important. And self-study is another one. And that one is probably my favorite. That's, that's probably my biggest, in my biggest toolbox in my professional life, in my personal life, especially, is always studying and it's it, I like self-study it's like I'm, I'm studying by myself I'm learning new things then I'm also studying myself like studying myself and studying for myself and I think that that um, that curiosity the inner curiosity that outer curiosity that's just always going to help you business or relationship so those are you know those are some that, that come to mind I love uh, this you know I could just sit at your feet and listen to you for hours. <laughs> I only have one more question for you, which yeah. is, um, I was going to talk to you about a song, but I'll switch it up. What's the next thing, talking about studying, what's the next thing you want to learn? The next thing that I want to learn. Oh man. I feel like I'm looking up trainings all the time. You know, I'll, I'll go with one that's coming up that I'm actually thinking I'm going to Brisbane to do an animal flow training. So you'll probably see this in some of the, in some of my classes soon. It's a, it's a really interesting movement training. That's uh, quite, quite dynamic. It's uh, you'll see, it's called animal flow and it's mm -hmm. um, really, really kind of playful energy. So that's something movement based and I'm really interested in somatics. So um, somatic therapy, somatic experiencing, because I love, I'm kind of a nerd about neuroscience. And I talk about it in my videos sometimes. Like the reason why we're, we're anxious or we're scared and we tell ourselves, calm down, calm down, like chill out. The reason that this doesn't work, this incessant like telling ourselves like to chill, to calm, like it's okay, is because our nervous system that controls whether we're, um, we're stressed or we're calm, it was, it was built, we're programmed way before we ever spoke language, way, way, way back in our old animal body. So it makes sense that it doesn't respond to verbal language, but it does respond to the breath. It responds to these exhales of soothing exhales. It responds to vibration, to a little bit of shaking, to a little bit of tapping, like a reason why like chanting alm feels so good. It has more to do with the vibration in the body and soma, it means body. So somatic experiencing is more about how we get into our body to release memories, to release stories, to release uh, trauma and tension. And uh, so I'm looking into that. I love this, I love this. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah. for being on the show today, Cold Chance. Uh, oh, thank my you pleasure. For all the wisdom that you've shared. Um, for my listeners, I highly recommend you check out this woman uh, and check out her course as well. Where can we find it? So you can find all the information about the retreats, the, the videos, the Emerge course at coldchanceyoga.com. That has all the things that'll take you all the places. <laughs> Wonderful. And for women founders, I would see this work that Colchen does as a necessary addition to your business growth and your self-study curriculum, because there's only so much speaking that can occur. There's only so much analysis that can occur, only so much brain activity, as Cole just said. The body work, the movement work is what our primal nature responds to. So... It's a must. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cole. And see you soon, I hope. Yeah. See you on your mat. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Wealth While You're Red show. We'd love to hear from you. 
tell us about the next person you would like to see on the show. And we'd also love to know the next topic you'd like us to explore or anything else you want to discuss with us. As always, you can send in your burning questions and suggestions to info at nancyflores.com. See you soon for another gorgeous conversation in the next episode.